welcome to an extremely special episode, maybe the most exciting episode that we've ever had here at the Reboot Recovery Show. And the reason it's so exciting is because today I am going to be joined for the first time ever by my amazing wife and founder of Reboot Recovery, Jenny Owens. Let's get started. going to absolutely be an incredible episode. This is the most natural episode for me because it's like we're at home at the dinner table, but without the amazing food, which speaking of which we should start getting some amazing food at our podcast would be really good. But um, Jenny is here with me. A lot of you who listen to our podcast know that she is always operating behind the scenes in tremendous ways. And a lot of people don't even know that Jenny, the idea to start Reboot actually began with you. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. But the primary reason that she is on the podcast today is because our book, Healing What's Hidden, coming out through Ravel Baker Books, officially releases on September 6th. September the 6th. And so we are very excited that if you listen to this after September the 6th, you can go on Amazon and order it. Or if it's before September the 6th, you can go and pre-order it. And when you do, if you do pre-order it, you can head over to healingwhatshidden.com and claim a very cool free journal that we've made that's sort of a companion, if you will, to the book. So, But before we get into the history of Reboot and all that stuff, let's just talk about this book project. Because those of you at home, let me just tell you, we raised three young boys together. We lead Reboot together. We've been married for 16 years to each other. Mm -hmm. And... We manage multiple sports schedules, and she has to put up with me. So the point is, we are together a lot. Most married couples have not spent, in their 50 years of marriage, the amount of hours that we have spent together in 16, right? And so I guess the first thing is, why do you do it? Why do you even put up with me? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Why do you even put up with me? But I want to talk about this book project, because we had never embarked on something this big Mm -hmm. before. Um, This was a big undertaking at a time when we had a lot going on with our three boys, etc. So first off, I guess, what was the motivation behind why did we even think a book was a good idea, right? Because about halfway through, we're going to talk about this, we were like, I think this was a big mistake. Mm -hmm. But I guess, what was the reason? Like, how did we envision this book helping? How were we going to use it as a resource? Kind of what was the rationale behind why we wanted to do a book? Well, hey, everybody. First off, I'm Jenny. Um, It's nice to be here with you. And um, yeah, this book is, it's like, as we described it, it's like a pregnant lady getting ready to give birth. And we are at like the 39 week mark with this. So we're miserable. So we're feeling a little bit like we want to get over the finish line. We want to have the book out there into the world for everyone to. I don't know, take pictures of an ooh and ah over like babies. No, I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. To right. read. Um, but what, so the, the original thought behind the book, um, at least for me, is that we've talked with a lot of people in the community where we've met in chance encounters and we end up having these conversations where we learn that they're walking through something really hard. And that's something that happens a lot for me. That's why Reboot got started. People sometimes will just open up and... I've often wanted to share something physical with them that I could give to them in that moment or something a little bit maybe more tangible or easier for them to grab a hold of than, well, just sign up for a course. One, because there's not always a course available at that time. There may not be a course in their area. And in the past, we didn't always have virtual courses, which we'll have hopefully now frequently going forward. Um, But a book would be a great just lifeline, I think, for people um, in those situations. And so that idea has been there for a while. Um, and I think when COVID happened and when, as Evan may share later or has shared in other times, um, kind of created the crisis course and we began thinking, how can what we've learned about trauma from the military and the first responders yeah. be distilled in a way that it can help anybody who's experienced any type of trauma? Mm. Um, the book was always a key part of that because it just has such a broad reach and we're hoping that people will see it maybe in an airport kiosk or in a store or online when they're just searching for help. And that will be their first point of contact with Reboot. And ultimately, we can help them more through the program. And I think that's the, the thing, right? I think if you were to ask us, 
why write a book? What is the goal of the book? Because, I mean, you know, I don't think this is a big secret to everybody. I mean, you know, there's this world of sort of influencer marketing and, you know, building your social and selling books and being best-selling authors and traveling the country speaking. And that's not really our heart and our goal. Matter of fact, I don't like to travel very much. Jenny knows I hate flying. I'd like to just be at home. I like writing and teaching, but I'd like to be able to drive to where I'm writing mm-hmm. and teaching if possible. And I like to be at our sports games with our kids and stuff like that. And so the goal of the book was not to develop some bigger platform. You know, we feel like God's already been developing the platform, so to speak, through our volunteer leaders around the country. That's the platform, right? Not us and what our words are, but it was really that it would be another on-ramp to a course, yeah. right? That it would be a way that when she sees somebody and she's right, everywhere you go, I don't care where you're at, somehow people end up sharing like their most intimate details with you. And I've watched it in our marriage, and they don't do that with me. Um, I, I'm... I can go to the grocery store and I'm in and out in 15 minutes. She goes to the grocery store 45 minutes later. She's talking to some lady about a terrible traumatic experience that she had, right? I mean, that's the difference of relationship, and that's just kind of a special gifting I think God gave you. But to be able to give them a resource that we know the goal of that resource is to eventually get them plugged into a community, Mm -hmm. you know, is really the outcome that we hope this book will have. It's another weapon or tool uh, to to do that, another arm. I think as a gift option, I mean, I think sometimes we, we hear so someone good. who's lost a loved one and we want to send a card, but I've had this impulse to want to send this content to a family member who lost their father. And, I, you know, there was a lot of trauma wrapped up in that. So I just think this is going to be empowering for people not just to consume for themselves, but to be able to share with the people that they come in contact with. Yeah. So this is a, a question um you know, the, the book, we have a, a copy of one of the advanced reader, reader copies here with us in our hands. And, you know, the book, I think, ended up being 270-some pages or 240 pages long. Um, it was a big undertaking mm-hmm. for us. And, you know, I think finding the time, it wasn't so much the hours of the day, you know, because we have the hours, but it's actually the creative headspace, right? And I think for us, that was one of the challenges. I think what was, from your perspective, and maybe there's some funny things we can talk about here too. What were some of the more challenging elements of saying, hey, we're going to be first-time authors. We're going to figure out how to do this. What were some of the harder parts for you? Um, well, for me, I wanted to support you. And Evan, is. we always talk about, he's like an initiator. He can get a job 70 80% done really easily. He's, he works really quickly, really efficiently. He's not overwhelmed easily by big tasks. Um and I'm more of a finisher, so I have a hard time. I get overwhelmed with something that's daunting. But if you give me something that's partway done, I can usually kind of refine it and help improve it. Wow. So I think it was challenging at the onset to get Evan the space to be able to do that big behemoth lift at the beginning to get the book to 70 80% done. Um, because, it, as you can imagine, it's, it's not something you can just write in little snippets when you have time in your day or at the end of a long day, you really need right. to go on a writer's retreat and spend considerable amount of time praying, thinking through, uh, just ideating the flow of the book. And so I wanted to support him as just as his wife. And, we're, you know, we've got three kids. So getting that on the books was hard. I think we tried yeah. a couple of times. It failed, yeah. It didn't work. We, he just kept coming back and having things pop up that took the place of the book. And because we're running Reboot, it's not – it wasn't always our top priority to work on this book. I yes. mean, that's just it's never, it was never, never the top, was top priority. priority. Yeah. Um, so that was challenging. But Remember when we were on vacation? We went on vacation, and the deadline, I think, to submit the manuscript, I forget, was like, I want to say it was like July 1. And we went on vacation in like March maybe or mm-hmm. something. Whatever the time. We were like two or three months away, yeah. and the book was, was in shambles. The book was still in shambles. Um, I mean, it was like we had bits and pieces going on, mm-hmm. you know? But there was definitely... Um, large uh, um, I'm thinking like synapses like there wasn't the connective tissue Mm -hmm. wasn't there and we were on vacation and it started taking our vacation time pretty much we were with our kids and we were constantly talking about the book um, and we were able to be without our kids for a couple of the days and we worked on the book and Jenny said why don't you just stay here in this beautiful paradise and just write the book Mm -hmm. and in hindsight I should have just said you know what that's a great idea I did not say that instead I was like no 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 we'll be able to get it until we actually came into crunch time Um, and I thought, for me at least, I thought that writing the manuscript was going to be the hardest part. I was naive, Mm -hmm. and whoa, did I not know. Writing the manuscript, 
was relatively easy <laughs> compared to editing the manuscript. Once you did get, do a writer's retreat, which did happen after that yes. vacation, yes. he went away yes. for a few days and, and locked himself. And for anyone who's out there who's intimidated by big projects, um, don't write a book. But <laughs> no, I was going to say about the writing, you know, the way that I did it, um, I don't know if this is good advice or not, but for me, every time I sat down to write, I did a couple things. One, and a friend of mine gave me this advice, I just started to write anything I was thinking. Like, it could be about my day, it could be about how I was feeling, it could be a prayer, it could be whatever, and it got my brain sort of in this. The other thing that I did was I had a certain, um, this is a weird thing, but like I needed um, lyrical content that triggered creative writing in my brain, and so for me, I listened to hip-hop artists, like I listened to Lecrae or Trip Lee or something like that that's kind of a word poet. Mm -hmm. That got me going, and I'd listen to that almost every day for the first hour before I kind of found my rhythm. Another thing is, is I realized that it took me two or three hours to actually creating good content. So I would find that the first hour was almost always trashed. Mm -hmm. And I got comfortable recognizing that this hour is part of the process. I don't need to, like, condemn myself because I would, like, the first couple months of writing, I would start to write and then feel so bad that what I'd written wasn't good enough. I'd sit and shame myself and then lose sight of what was coming. You know, but for us, the editing process was something that Jenny managed almost holistically by herself because I am not great at the details. And so mm -hmm. we thought that the editing and writing process was going to be hard. But let's be honest, the hardest part was what? Well, I'm thinking about the, the citations at the back, but. <laughs> oh, the citations at <laughs> the back. Was that was the hardest because for her. Because we were having to. Cite multiple types of formats of things and hunting down. So we are not aligned on what the hardest part was. Quote, and you know, you just have to make sure that everything is is on board because you're publishing this book. Right. So you make sure you're giving everybody. Well, and and what I had done is I had just went online and typed content about trauma and just copied and pasted, <laughs> no. and that was you know it's really time saving. No, but he did include, he did include <laughs> research throughout. As you'll see, there's some research sites cited throughout the book. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. He didn't cite it when he wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord! Why so, are you telling on me? I did. I didn't cite it properly. Where did you find this? So oh that was gosh. some of the stressful pieces for me. Um, and then just like making sure that everything, like Evan said, the synapses were there. Everything connected. I think when you're writing and in these segments of time, that sometimes you would write for an intense period of time, and then not write for three or four weeks, and then write again. Putting it all together, it, my role I think was to make sure that there was continuity and that yes. the ideas flowed. Um, and we worked well together doing that. You know, some changes. Okay, this. But I write really like, good. You do. See, that He's was a concise. that was a grammatical error. It should have been really well. But there were some times where I'm like, <laughs> okay, this sentence isn't quite. I'm having to read the sentence a couple of times to understand what you're saying. Let's re reword it. So you know, we did that. And in our relationship, me not taking offense to that because yeah. I put my heart and soul into this and learning how to take constructive feedback from someone who you who you want more than anything. I just wanted Jenny to say, honey, you're enough. What you wrote was incredible. But her job in this time was to say, this isn't clear. Let me rewrite it better. And you can see, and we go back and forth in the book where she'll say, you know, I, Jenny, and then it's her speaking. And then it'll say Evan. Mm -hmm. And for me, I am i didn't know the citations were this hard because I was not involved in that. For me, the hardest part of the book was picking the cover and the title. Mm -hmm. I thought mm -hmm. that we had a title. We had what's called a working title. And we wrote down, how many titles do you think oh we came gosh. up with? I had a running note in my phone that I pulled up recently. And like, if you can see this, but I'll tell you how many swipes on an iPhone. One, two, three, four, five. Well, those are Swipe or no swiping. Four or five big swipes of names. <laughs> eight, eight micro swipes, 100, 10 micro swipes. 100 plus names that we tossed around. And remember, we spent so many precious hours oh of gosh. our time together. Which Hundreds. We don't have a lot of time, FaceTime together. Yeah. Many of our date nights were spent tossing yeah. around book title names the yeah. entire time, which was it, fun at first, but at the end it was very high pressure because in high stakes, time. well, because you, you know that the cover is going to be the first impression and the title is what people need to really resonate with to think this is a book for me. So we were under the gun time-wise, but we also just wanted it to be right. We wanted it to be clear and to communicate, uh, but also to touch someone's heart. So Yeah, and I think it's so hard to know what title will resonate mm -hmm. Um, because there's lots of different directions you could take it. You could say, let's make it more lighthearted. Like we had a title once that we were calling a good book for the worst days of your life was one of the titles that I really liked. 
And I thought that was it. I thought, this is it. This is a book that people, everybody wants to have on your shelf because it's a good book for the worst day of your life. And whether you've had the worst days or your worst days are coming, mm-hmm. they're going to happen. Yeah. But it was interesting when we tested it, about 50% of people said it sounded too soft. They said it sounded like chicken soup for the soul, which was not what our book was. You know, it sounded more like a daily devotional. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we came up with other titles that were very serious, you know, uh, uh, using lots of deep words. We, we also had this concept. I remember my friend Mike, he, he said, Evan, you don't want it to be a brown bag cover or a brown bag title. And I said, what do you mean is that? And, and uh, he said, a brown bag cover or title is one that people are ashamed or afraid to have that book in their hand when they're sitting at that airport uh, because of the title. Is so it, 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 it tells everybody what they're thinking or what they're going, or it tells too, you know, it, it, it tells too much. It reveals too much or it's too heavy or too serious. He said, you don't want them to feel like they have to put their book in a brown bag, you know, to hide the cover. And so ultimately we decided to call the book healing what's hidden a practical, uh, so practical steps to overcoming trauma. And as soon as we got the book, I had severe buyer's remorse. I felt like we messed up. It's not the right title. It's a, you know, it's like you begin second guessing and you start having these sort of panic moments. Did you have any of that or was that just me? A little bit. I mean, we're talking now about the cover, the image. Yeah. Um, we had, we had the name nailed down, but we had two covers to choose from. I think we could have gone either way with that as well. Um, so there was a period of time where I would see this and think, is that the right thing? But as I've seen it more and more, I've seen the cover on Amazon and on some of our posts, I, I'm embracing it. I'm excited about it. It's yeah, not too. something that I look at and think, man, we screwed that up. So me too. So I'm really, I think it's communicating what we hoped it would. It does The cover design requires a little bit of great imagination to understand what we were getting at. But a lot of people who've seen it have said, oh, it's like something swept under the rug. Right, they get it. And I think for me... For anyone who's wondering. Yeah, and this is, again, a it's yeah, a just an early rendering. Cover, but. but I think the point is, is that I think in the creative process, writing this book, I've done, we've done three curriculums together, four, if you count the crisis course, we've done four curriculums together, curriculi, <laughs> curriculum uh, feminine, that's uh, Latin. I took four years of Latin. Jenny, how many years of Latin did you take? Zip. Zip is not a Latin word. <laughs> um uh, yeah, and, and, and I think in the creative process, something that really, um, it exposed some insecurities in me that really, since I had, you know, most people don't know, I did music for many, many years. I was a musician. And I think that that same process, when you write a song and you put it out there for the world, there's that sense of you're really proud of it. And the minute you release it, you're kind of like, mm. but what if I'm not enough? Oh, I've definitely felt that. <laughs> what if, what if, what if it's not what I thought, what if I thought it was good, yeah. you know, and then they read it and they're like, this is not good. And then only your friends and family are like, yeah, your baby's beautiful. And meanwhile, they're like, that's the ugliest baby I've ever seen. Right. And I think that feeling of insecurity, I've had to really do something. I think God's done a, a semi miraculous work. Cause you know me, I'm an achiever. I'm a go getter. Um, I'm definitely swayed by what people think. I'm, I'm prone to that for sure. You actually talk about that in the book. I do talk it's about that in the book. And I think that for me, God has really, through this process, has in many ways delivered me of that um, so that I, I really do feel like I've sort of said, Lord, you're going to do with this book what you do with it. And I've not really pushed it super hard. God's opened doors. He's made ways for some cool things to happen and maybe more on the horizon. But I think I've always kind of felt like if it serves as an on-ramp to get people into the program, which it will by default, mm-hmm. then we're good. And that's so freeing. But, but and, and not characteristic of me. You know, yeah. it's so not characteristic of me. Mm-hmm. And I think that God's really done it. And I think that this book, believe it or not, writing it helped me heal from some of those stuck mm-hmm. points that I've had in my own life. And I truly say this, like, as Jenny and I wrote this together, it was a blessing to me. And this is coming from a guy who doesn't go around talking about, oh, I'm a trauma victim and look at what I've gone through and all that. I don't, we don't do that. That's not the way that we lead. We don't lead through our story, which a lot of people, a lot of ministries and missions do. But as I was doing, I remember writing and thinking that, you know, some of this information is things that I think that, that I need to speak to myself sometimes, that I need to go forgive this person. I need to go do this. And what's weird is the curriculum never did that for me. Mm. The book did in a different way. Um, and as you were going back through, I remember reading some of the parts that you wrote. And I want to talk about the part you wrote where you, sh- you wrote um, our story. 
of how we came to build Reboot. And I took a swipe at it, and it wasn't very good. And you said, I think I can write this section a lot better. And so you and you did that with a lot of the sections, I mean, to be honest. I mean, it was like mine were more like rough outlines. But you went and you told that story. And I'm just wondering, would you mind just, I would love to open it up. Um, would you mind just here on the podcast, I'd love for you to actually read uh, a small part of that story, if you could. I want you to start right here and just read it because I think it's so beautifully written and it captures the heart and it's kind of long. But I think if you're sitting home and listening, I think what you'll hear is that God is faithful, that when you, when he lays something on your heart, he'll open doors to make it possible. But number two is, is how Jenny doesn't really get a chance very often to tell her side of the story. She is much more reserved than me. She doesn't live to be on the camera, all that stuff, you know. And I want her to be able to share some of her heart with you to hear how did we get here? Because Jenny has been such a huge part of the journey. Matter of fact, she is the originator of the journey. She's the the OG of all OGs, the original gangster. So, you know, for years they called you J-Mama because you gave birth to this movement. That is, for any old reboot member, you know, J-Mama. J-Mama. So why don't you read it to us? Uh, I, Jenny, didn't know much about PTSD growing up. I'm ashamed to say that I used it as a punchline more than anything. I had a friend in middle school whose dad had served in Vietnam. My friend would joke about how sometimes his dad would hear a car backfire and dive under the table in the middle of dinner. I laughed. I'm sorry that I didn't have more compassion for my friend, who was likely using humor to cope with what must have been a pretty challenging home life, or for his dad, who never truly came home from war. I didn't understand how fighting for your life and watching your friends die could change you in ways you couldn't explain. But when I was a freshman in college and terrorists crashed a couple of commercial airplanes into two buildings, killing thousands of men, women, and children, the notion of trauma and its many ripple effects began making subtle waves in my mind. I found myself captivated by the stories of heroism and sacrifice, both stateside and on the battlefield, that dominated the news media. When in my first job out of graduate school as an occupational therapist, I was told that our outpatient clinic was going to be tr- begin treating active duty soldiers with traumatic brain injuries, my heartbeat quickened. For some reason, ever since 9-11, I had felt drawn to our nation's combat wounded. This job was literally a dream come true. I immersed myself in military culture as best I could. I printed out the Army rank structure and discreetly discreetly (laughs) Googled every acronym I heard. As soldiers returned from deployment, people began using the term walking wounded, and I knew exactly what it meant. My patients were physically fit and apparently healthy, but their legs bounced continuously under the treatment table. They never sat with their backs to the door. Their eyes were dark and shadowed, and while they worked hard to keep it together, sometimes these strong soldiers cried. Their inner pain was seeping out of them, and I couldn't ignore it. When an OT job became available at Fort Campbell, an army post about 45 minutes northwest of Nashville, I felt the unmistakable tug of what I knew to believe, of what I now believe is my calling. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I talked about it nonstop with Evan. I prayed. I asked God for a sign, and minutes later, pulled up behind a car with a bumper sticker that read, Go Army. I felt nervous excitement growing within me. Could we really uproot our lives in pursuit of this crazy dream? I was a new clinician with zero actual military experience, applying for a job in which I would be helping soldiers return to duty after traumatic brain injury. You know, driving Humvees, firing M16s, applying tourniquets, navigating with maps and compasses, and so on. All the things a 25-year-old civilian suburbanite female knows how to do, right? But I learned, and not for the last time, that God often uses the extras to play the leading roles in his stage. Evan and I moved to Pleasant View, Tennessee, a small town halfway between Fort Campbell and Nashville. He kept his job at a web development company, and I started working at the Warrior Resiliency and Recovery Center on Post. Keep going. Yeah, keep going a little bit more. I want you to Here are some things one. I quickly learned from my soldiers. You don't walk on the grass, you don't show up late, and you don't tell the shrinks that you're having mental problems. The first two could get you dressed down in public. The last one could get you kicked out of the military. The PTSD stigma was alive and well. But I wasn't a shrink. And for reasons outside my control or understanding, my soldiers began opening up to me. One sergeant asked, is it possible for my soul to die? I know I had one once, but now when I look inward, all I see is a dark black hole. Another spoke of the crushing guilt he felt. I stepped on the pressure plate. Why am I alive and he's dead? How do I look at his family knowing that I'm responsible? Another described to me what it felt like to watch the life ebb out of the eyes of a dying Iraqi child as he tried to rescue him from the wreckage caused by a roadside bomb. My heart is heavy just recalling the looks on their faces, silently acknowledging the invisible rucksacks of guilt and shame they carried. I remember the fog of isolation that surrounded them, severing them from anyone and everyone who couldn't understand what they'd gone through, and from God, who in their eyes had turned his back on them. So I spoke up. I began talking to my patients about God's nearness to the brokenhearted. 
about how he sets the captives free and comforts those who mourn, about the depth of Jesus' love for them and how he wants to carry their burdens and give them rest. It was like they'd come upon a spring of fresh water in the middle of a barren desert. The flicker of hope in their eyes lit a fire in my heart to find a way to continue the conversation for those who are willing to meet at the intersections of faith and trauma and ask the hard questions together. I mean, y'all, I mean, that is it right there. I mean, that's it. And that's this book. Even as I hear her read that, I still get the bumps and chills the same way we did when we were driving in that car to Louisville and it was laid on our heart to to do something more than play in a golf tournament, more than make a donation to some military charity. And we were told by everybody, the last thing you need is another veterans charity. The last thing you need is another first responder, another trauma nonprofit. There's too many nonprofits, you know, we were told by everybody that, but it, it didn't matter. And, um, and I think along the way, you know, there were so many conversations, so many times where, uh, I love that line you said about the extras. What's the line you said? God uses the extras to play leading roles on his stage. Yeah. That's and true. I think that in our life, that's what this book has become. You know, Jenny and I, there's not a lot of reasons why we should be authors on a book on trauma. You know, this is not a memoir. Um, and And there's not a lot of reasons why people should rush to the bookstore to go buy this or why people should be pre-ordering this book except for that God took two extras and he's allowed us to lead a movement that is impacting people around the world now and this book I believe is a a next step in what doors God is opening and he's it's sort of like we're we're trying to just be faithful and humble with what he gives us and this book is something that um, now that it's all done and now that it's here I have to say that I, I don't know if there's a project that I've ever been a part of that I'm more proud of whether or not it sells 10,000 copies, 100,000 copies, or 10 copies. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm counting on one of you who are listening to this to go order 10,000 copies, you know, so I'm counting on that. But my point is, I don't know. But what I do know is, is that we did our best, that we put our best foot forward, and that every word in this was written with love. Every word was written. And the question I kept asking myself, every time I would write a section and go back and rewrite it, I would always ask myself, I would say, if I am this person, how do I feel after reading this? Mm -hmm. And I would always ask, how do I feel? And then I would say how I feel. I feel encouraged. And I would say, no, 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 how do you really feel? And then I would say, I feel hopeful. No, no, how do you really feel? I feel motivated to move forward. You know, I would keep going to that. And then I would go back and rewrite it until the feeling that I wanted them to have at the end of that section. Because the way the book is written is it's 12 sections divided up into 60 micro chapters or micro lessons, we call them. And each lesson is meant to be this sort of easily, you know, you read it once, but you can reference it again and again and Mm -hmm. again. And so I just hope that as people get this book into their hands on on September the 6th and after that, um, my hope is is they sense the love that we wrote it with, Mm -hmm. you know, and the intentionality that we wrote it with because that's really the heartbeat. Um, And that's how we'll know it's successful in my eyes if people feel... The That's love. the origins of Reboot. We ha- right. we didn't have much to build a program on besides our love for the people that we came in contact with. That's right. And that's what differentiated what happened in our living room initially and eventually on Fort Campbell from the doctor's office or yeah. any other place that those soldiers were going on post was that we were there because we loved them. And so we're hopeful that that love can come through the pages of this book because that's really all we know to do and that's what that's the best we have to offer that's right now i will say i want to close with just a couple cool features that the book has yeah i wanted to talk about those little things at the end of the lessons is that what you're thinking about go for it oh well one one piece that i do credit our our editors at baker for helping us with is that they suggested and i think it's great that at the end of every short micro lesson as evan mentioned there's a what about you section and that's cool that evan talked about how does this make me feel because that was kind of a precursor for now, the book asks you, not just so how what? does this yeah. make you feel, but what now? how does it apply to your life? Yeah, good. Um, so I just opened randomly to this one. This section is on regret. What regrets do you have about your life since the trauma occurred? Um, let's see. What, if any, good and necessary things did not happen in your early life? How has this impacted you as an adult? So we're talking about child neglect in this or right. abuse in this section. 
direction. Right. Um, so I think that's exciting because that's those are those could be things you just reflect on. It could be great journal prompt, especially if you're someone who pre-orders and gets the healing what's in journal or any Ooh, journal. That was a smooth transition if, if to a like plug. To write, wow, that was good. If, any journal. But if you like to write and process that way, I think these are going to be so impactful. And they're, again, they're, they can be heavy, but they're as heavy as you want to go with it. That's right. Know? And that's how Reboot's always been. And the other thing we wanted to do is, and I'm going to be really transparent, a lot of times when I'm reading books, I feel like their stories are not true. They're like preacher stories. Hmm. And that's not, probably not the case. But sometimes I feel like that. And so I wanted to make sure that people knew that the stories of the people we tell in this book are real human beings who look, talk, walk, act just like everyday people. We know personally. That we know personally. And so we included a bunch of QR codes in the book that you can scan as you read it. And it actually takes you to the where are they now story about what has happened in their life over their healing journey. And it's this really unique thing in a book where like you're reading the story of Karen and then you get to go watch a video of Karen speaking to you directly, which is really, really, really cool. Um, you know what that is? That's, that's reboot, bleeding into the bleeding book. Bleeding the book, right. <laughs> or another thing, we have all these additional resources that we put in the book where we have this QR content and they'll say like, if you want to go deeper on the subject, here's a bunch more content you can go get that's like bonus content at this QR code. And I've not seen that in a book. Maybe it's really common, but I've not seen that. It's almost like a book within the book, a bonus book. So that has been really cool to us. And even conducting those interviews has been like, whoa, super encouraging, you know? So anyway, we've belabored this, but we are really excited about this this book, this product, this thing, this gift. Um, and if you would do us the favor of going and ordering the book, Healing What's Hidden. You can get it on Amazon, but then the biggest thing is leaving us a review. It's really important that we have 100 reviews in the first couple of weeks, and the reason is is because that is the way the algorithm works on Amazon to help get people resources, and so we don't have any control over that other than just what we kind of put into it, and so if you read it and you enjoy it, uh, please leave us a review. If you read it and you hate it, don't leave us a review. And if you, <laughs> if you choose to buy it through another seller, there it's on Barnes and Target, Noble, Target and, yeah. through um, your locals. Baker, yeah, I don't know the name of their URL, but Baker Bookhouse. Baker Bookhouse. But you can also leave a review on Goodreads. That's helpful to us as well. So if, yeah. if you didn't buy it on Amazon, you can still leave us a, a review or just let us know what you think. We'd love to hear your feedback. That's right. So again, thank you so so much for listening to this very special episode of the reboot recovery show hopefully we can get jenny to come back i'd love for her to share some of the amazing work that we're seeing uh things growing in peer support programs and our research that we're doing i'd love for her to share some of this so maybe we can persuade her to come back but again love thank you. you for joining us and as always keep moving forward as we overcome trauma together god bless oh, no, no, no.